Hey everyone, welcome to the first lecture in our series on imitation learning. I'm Sanjivan Chaudhary, a research scientist at Aurora and soon to be assistant professor at Cornell. In this series, we will journey into the depth of a topic that is at the core of my research, imitation learning. The purpose of our quest is to answer at a deep mathematical level a single question. What does it mean to imitate? The answer, as we shall see, is simple and profound, but there are many twists and turns along the way. So let's begin this journey with that very question, what does it mean to imitate? One of the first things that come to mind when we think of imitation learning is how we humans use imitation to acquire a new skill, a new language, or even new culture. In animals, imitation can manifest in simpler forms, such as mirror neurons that help an infant monkey imitate human facial expressions. In the field of computer science, Alan Turing showed that imitation learning could be used to build an artificial general intelligence by simply solving a game where the AI has to score more points than a human. However, for robotics, imitation learning is a promising way to program robots via demonstrations to automate tasks such as driving that people can demonstrate but find difficult to hand program. For instance, at Aurora, where I currently work, we've used imitation learning of expert human driving data to build a fully autonomous truck that can navigate through long stretches of highway and busy intersections. Okay, it would appear imitation learning has a really large scope. But if you have to make progress, we need to narrow this down. Let's begin by formalizing imitation learning in the broader framework of decision making. A universal framework to define decision making is a Markov decision process or MDP, uh, which is a tuple of states, actions, transition functions, and costs. Okay, that was a lot to unpack, so we need an example to understand MDPs better. And what better example than the most pressing application of playing Mario Kart? Okay, so we have a track, we have a cart, and we want our learner to drive just like Mario. Let's abstract away the scene and represent the robot as a node in a graph. The node represents the state of the robot, so the position of the cart, the velocity, the heading, and so on. At a given state, the robot can take many possible actions. For example, go straight, turn left, turn right, speed up, slow down, and so on. When it takes an action, it goes to a next state, where it takes another action and goes to another state, it keeps going, and so on, until it reaches the final state at the end of the finish line. Okay, let's return back to our formulation. We can now write ST belongs to S as being the state of the robot at time T, AT belongs to A as being the action taken at time PST plus 1 given ST, AT being the probability of transitioning to state ST plus 1 given that you executed action AT at state ST. And finally, CST, AT being the cost of executing action AT in state ST. Goal is to find an optimal policy pi, that's a mapping from states to actions, that minimizes the overall value j of pi which is the cumulative sum of costs at every time step, with states and actions being drawn from the distribution induced by the policy pi. In other words, it's asking us to find a policy pi, such that if we were to drive with that policy, we would create trajectories that are low cost, for example, have really low lap times, or don't go off the track, and so on. Now all this is well and good, but I've sneaked in an assumption that makes this problem hard to solve. Can you detect what that is? Think of the one-step cost CSTAT. Are they really known to us? I mean, do we really know how much weight to put on minimizing lap time versus not falling off the track versus not colliding into things? We don't. They're sort of implicitly contained in the mind of Mario. And if you don't know these costs, we certainly don't know the value j of pi. And if you don't know the value j of pi, how is it that we can optimize? 
uh, for a policy pi. Okay, perhaps we're overthinking this. What if we try something really simple, like learning a direct mapping from states to actions from expert data? That sounds like an awesome idea. So let's think through the steps. Step one is to get demonstrations from Mario driving. So this involves um, having Mario drive run and run the racetrack and recording these trajectories. Um, so you create a database of trajectories where every element of the database is a sequence of states, actions, next state, and so on. Step two, use your favorite supervised learning to map states to actions. So think of state here as an image representing the current snapshot of where the robot is. Then you push that through a learner and map it to an action to get steering angles. Really simple stuff. So we just talked about the training process. What would happen when we test this policy? See the learner begin okay, but then start to weave around a little till it loses control and spins horribly off the track. Okay, so this was a total disaster. Let's try to take a step back and understand what happened. Uh, first of all, we I should admit to ourselves that we scoped down prematurely. There are actually some problems in the way we scoped things. First of all, what went wrong in that example? Um, so let's revisit. We had some demonstrations of Mario driving around the track that we're imitating, and we saw a comedy of errors that ensued uh, when we rolled out our policy. So there's five acts to this play. Um, act one, the learner seemed to be following the demonstration perfectly well when it began. Act two, at some point, the learner makes a mistake. I mean, it's followable just like any of us and makes a teeny epsilon mistake. It goes off uh, the expert trajectory. Act three, the learner enters a state as a result that it has not seen a training time. Because it hasn't seen a training time, it doesn't really know what to do, and so again makes a mistake. Act 4, things start to really build up, mistakes are uh, compound. And finally, Act 5, um, at this point the learner is so far off the expert trajectory that it spins up the track and never recovers because it's never really seen how to recover. And while this might seem comical, this is an old problem that has been with us since the birth of imitation learning. So back in the late 80s, Dean Pomelu at Carnegie Mellon wrote a paper titled Alvin, which was the first self-driving car that used end-to-end -end learning. So mapped an image and range LIDAR to steering angles. Um, and he made a really interesting observation that in some ways gave gave birth to a phenomenon in imitation learning. So in his words, he says, the network must not solely be shown examples of accurate driving, but also how to recover, that is return to the road center once a mistake has been made. Sounds awfully familiar to the problem we just talked about, where um, if the network only ever sees um, driving data of how the human drives, it never really learns to recover from mistakes. Now, interestingly, after 30 years, this problem still persists today. Um, and, and almost any paper uh, applying imitation learning to real world robotics uh, encounters this. And this will, in fact, be the topic of our next lecture. Unfortunately, this is not the only problem. Um, the more you think about it, uh, it seems like overall, learning a direct mapping is just a bad metaphor that we've trapped ourselves into. Because oftentimes, for many real-world applications, we don't even have demonstrated robot actions. For instance, what if your robot is a high-dimensional, non-human controllable robot, like a seven-dimensional robot arm that's hard for a human to control, or even a 26-dimensional backflipping humanoid robot? Or what if the human is giving you implicit feedback, for example, teaching you by intervention, something we'll talk about in lecture four, or by showing you gestures, 
um, or even by uh, pressing e stops when things go don't go wrong. Um, imitation learning should generalize to learning from such feedback. Okay, so if learning a direct mapping from states to action was a bad metaphor, what is a right metaphor? Somewhere along the line, um, researchers in imitation learning came upon a radical notion. They asked the question, what if everything the human expert provides is rooted in their values? In other words, the sum of the cumulative costs that's implicit in their mind. Let's think about Mario. The notion is that in Mario's mind, there is a value function, a function that maps state and actions to value judgment. So high values are bad and low values are good here. Now, Mario doesn't tell us this value function, otherwise it would be very simple. We would just directly optimize it. Instead, Mario shows us demonstrations. For example, Mario acts optimally according to their values. Um, they also show us corrections. For example, um, when things go wrong, uh, when we are off the track, how should we recover optimally? And that says something about Mario's values. Finally, Mario intervenes when uh, things go really wrong. Um, and these points of intervention uh, also give us clues about Mario's values. Right? So it's almost as if uh, there's a value function in Mario's mind and it's leaking through these various feedback modes. And we want to find a value function that's consistent with all of these inputs. That's the notion. Okay, so how does one act upon this insight? We invite you to think of imitation learning through the lens of a game. This is a game between two players, a learner and an adversary. The learner reasons over a space of policies pi, and the adversary reasons over a space of value functions. The payoff of the game is the value of the learner minus the value of the expert. So, from the learner's perspective, it's simply trying to be optimal with respect to the value function chosen by the adversary. On the other hand, the adversary tries to find potential value functions that make the expert look much better than the learner. Any policy that's at the equilibrium of this game is set to imitate the expert. That is our framework. Throughout the course of this series, we will see that this framework has an incredible broad reach, although we won't directly talk about it till the very end. So in lecture three, when we talk about imitation learning as online learning, we will first see the appearance of this two-player game. Later in lecture five, when we think about imitation learning as a gateway to reinforcement learning, we will see how even reinforcement learning can be thought of as a game. In lecture six, when we think about a traditional notion of imitation learning, like recovering cost functions, we can see how a game unifies uh, two very popular streams of approaches. And finally, in lecture eight, when we view imitation learning through the lens of distribution matching, that uh, we will derive estimators that look like the solution to a game. Finally, in lecture nine, we will talk in detail about our game theoretic framework that will unify um, all, all these aforementioned approaches. And that brings us to an end of this first lecture. To recap, the key challenge we took on today is to try to come up with a definition for imitation. We considered one obvious approach, uh, directly try to learn the experts mapping from state to action, and saw that this catastrophically fails. Um, first, whenever the learner enters a state not visited by the expert, it doesn't know what to do. Second, it's not always possible for experts to demonstrate actions. Subsequently, uh, our key insight was to look at imitation learning as inferring the expert's latent values, and this led to definition for an imitation game. But we're left with many, many questions that we all hope to explore in the coming lectures. For example, how can we learn from interventions? Something we look at lecture four, or how do we recover the expert's cost functions? Something we will look at lecture six. And finally, what is this game and how do we solve it? Uh, something that we'll dive deep in lecture nine. Okay, so we are about to dive into a deep rabbit hole 
uh, of imitation learning where hopefully we will learn fundamental mathematical insights. Um, I'm excited to take this journey with you all and I hope to see you in the next lecture. Be well everyone.